All right, so today's message is called Stay in the Word. We're talking about three steps to victory, and last week, Stop Believing Lies. This one is Stay in the Word. Now, I want you to think about um, why would a person, a believer, ever walk away from the Father? Because we've all done it. Uh, maybe it was a few years for some of you. Maybe it was a few months. Maybe a few weeks. Maybe a few days. Maybe a few minutes. So don't be judgmental of someone who's walked away for a few years and you say, well, I've never done that. Well, you've done it for a few minutes. I guarantee you. All of us have. And the reason that we do it, uh, I'm going to get into that reason very deeply in the message, but it's because we follow what we think and what we want and what we feel. And so we're gonna talk about that and some of you might pick up on, I just described the soul. What we think, mind, what we want, will, and what we feel, emotions. So we're following what our own soul wants, not what the Spirit of God is telling us. So we'll get into that, all right? But why would anyone ever walk away from the Father? So I thought about this afternoon when I was thinking about this. Um, when Elaine, my daughter, was three years old, Josh and James were in school, so Debbie and I and Elaine went to the mall. And we were in like Nordstrom's, and Debbie said, I'm gonna go try these clothes on you watch Elaine. And I said, okay. And then she said to me, look at me. <laughs> because I remember when she was saying it, I was looking, is, does Nordstrom's have a sporting goods section? You know, they don't by the way. But anyway, so I'm, I'm wondering where the sporting goods store is in the mall. And so um, she says, look at me. You know how Elaine is, and I know how you are. You watch Elaine. Now, Elaine is standing right beside me. I said, I got this. I said, we've already had two kids, and I haven't lost them that much. <laughs> so I've got this. Elaine's standing right here. Debbie walks into the dressing room. I watch her. The door shuts. I turn around and say, now, Elaine, 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 Elaine. <laughs> She's gone that fast. Well, we weren't far from the entrance, so I thought, well, if I get to the entrance to the mall, because I could find her probably in the store, but if she gets into the mall, you know, I may never find her. So I, I go to the entrance. I look to the left. I don't see her. I look to the right. She's about 100 feet from me, and she's walking like this, just going down the mall. And so I take off after these three precious ladies sitting on a bench, see this three-year-old, no parent, and they realize what's happened, that the wife told the husband to watch her. <laughs> and so they said to her, wait, hey, 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 sugar, where are you going? She went like this. She said, I go shopping. You know, so they said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait just a minute. Tell us what you're going to go shopping for. You know, they stopped her. So then I came up, and then they gave me the look. <laughs> you know, like your gender isn't good for hardly anything, you know, but <laughs> I've gotten that look a lot from ladies. But anyway, so <laughs> I was actually just thinking about the look I got from your wife one time, Thomas. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know if y'all know this, but I'm just going to, but Debbie dresses me. <laughs> Debbie puts my clothes out for me, you know, so, yeah, because I'm colorblind. And when I used to travel and preach and she couldn't go, she actually numbered my clothes. And like coats were like A, B, C, D, you know, pants, one, two, three, four. People used to ask me, what? oh, that's beautiful. What is that? I'd say B4. Kind of like bingo, you know, it's BB4. And so, anyway, so, so um, where was I here? I just thought I'd tell you that. So, Debbie, Elaine, okay. So, they give me this look, and so I, I, get, I get Elaine, and um, I'm trying to get back to the store before Debbie gets out of the dressing room, you know? And so we start heading back, but as I turn around and look, there's Debbie standing at the entrance, uh, giving me the look. <laughs> 
you know, so, okay. But why did my daughter walk away? She wasn't rebellious. She was just following what she was thinking. I go shopping, what she felt and what she wanted. Are you following me? Okay, listen, that's exactly what the Bible says about babies in Christ. They follow their soul and we have to learn to follow our spirit. Are you following me? So the reason we do is because we're three parts. I know that doesn't sound like that's an amazing revelation, but we're three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. Body. We are a trichotomy, not a dichotomy. There are just a few that say we're a dichotomy. We only have two parts, but it's, it's not true. Biblically, it's very easy to show we're three parts. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when he was on this earth, his body went in the tomb. Scripture says you will not leave his soul in Hades, or Sheol says the Old Testament, New Testament, Hades, which is the place of the waiting of the dead. So his soul during those three days went to Hades, and then on the cross he said, into, into thy hands I commit my spirit. See the, see the three? Body, soul, and spirit. Uh, Genesis 2, when God created man, you'll see all three in one verse. Verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He didn't form his soul or spirit of the dust of the ground. He formed his body. From dust your body came, from to dust your body will return. He, so that's his body. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. This is the word for spirit. Spirit. So there he became a spirit. And he man became a living soul. See what I'm saying? So spirit, soul, and body. Everyone get that? Are you with me? You got to be with me on this one because we're going to go very deep. Is everyone with me? Okay. Now, God created our spirits to relate to him. He created our souls to relate to him and his creation. His creation, including other human beings as well, plants, animals, trees, all the things, you know, that we relate to his creation. We can climb a mountain, we can swim in the ocean, and he created our bodies to relate to his creation. And that's where, I was, that's where I was going with, we can swim in the ocean, climb a mountain, something like that. So our bodies he created to relate to his creation. Our spirits he created to relate to him. Our souls he created to relate to him and his creation. Here's the problem. When Adam and Eve died, when they sinned, pardon me, when they sinned, their spirits died. If you remember, God said, if you eat that, you will die. Their bodies didn't die. Now, death set in, and eventually they died, but their bodies didn't die immediately. Their souls didn't die because he heard, Adam said, I heard you walking in the garden, and I was afraid. That's an emotion. And so I made a choice in my will to hide because I, I thought that would be the best thing to do. See what I'm saying? His mind, will, and emotions were still working, but his spirit died. Because God said, you eat that, you'll die. What died? Their spirits died. Ephesians 2 says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And he made us alive when we came to Christ. Jesus said, we quote this verse, but we kind of miss the first part. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It's great to talk about abundant life. But listen to what he actually said. I've come that you might have life. You're not even alive without me. You're existing, but you're not alive. I came that you might have life. Are y'all following me? So our spirits died. So the problem is that Adam and Eve learned to relate to God only without their spirits, only by what they could reason in their own minds, what they wanted and what they felt was best. Mind, will, and emotions. Let me put this up here. Mind is what we think. Will, what we desire. Emotions, what we feel. Mind, what we think. Emo uh, will, what we desire or want. And emotions, what we feel. Now listen to me. This is why it is so, this is why Christians have problems. Because we get into a situation and we make a decision based on what we think, what we want, and what we feel. 
And I'm going to say something very strongly to you. I don't care what you think, what you want, or what you feel. I care what God wants, what God says, what God thinks, and what God feels, and what God wants. And that's the only way to make the right decision is to find out what the Word says about what you want to decide. So you, when you make a soulish decision, it's selfish until your soul matures. You need to make a spiritual decision. So here's the problem. Here's point number one. The soul is selfish. The soul is selfish. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the soul means self. Soulish, selfish. The soul is selfish. And we came into this world with a dead spirit. So for years, we related to God. And think about this, with our minds, only our minds. Now, we still can use our minds, but remember, we, we need to renew our minds. We need to have the mind of Christ. We need to convert our souls, the Bible says, which again, your mind will and emotions. But we come in Thinking, think about how many people, when they're trying to figure out God and they're not saved yet, they have a dead spirit, how off they can get all these different religious sects, how screwed up they can get because they're only relating to God by what their own intellect can figure out. Their own minds. So I'm on this guy. Now we're talking about the soul is selfish, but we got mind, will, and emotions. I don't have time to cover the other two, but I'm just going to do a little study on mind. Let me tell you a little bit about your mind, and then I'm going to tell you a spiritual truth that's going to help you a lot. So your mind is the best computer possible on this earth today, and they will never, never, ever invent a computer better than the human mind. As when you talk to scientists who actually understand the mind, they'll clarify. They'll, they'll, they will back up what I'm saying. Your mind's unbelievable. Your mind knows everything that you've ever seen, heard, or experienced. And it's categorized it. Everything. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, where is it? Because <laughs> I can't remember it. It's in your subconscious. That's where it is. And when you're trying to remember it, you're trying to bring it to your conscious mind. For instance, you'll say, oh, what was that guy? That, the, remember the plumber? I need to get the, that plumber back. Came to our house. Remember, uh, you told me to your spouse. Remember, his name was John. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to get him. And I was just trying to remember, but I can't remember his last name. I can't, I don't, I don't remember the name of the company. Do you remember the name of the company. And, uh, you know, remember he had two kids. Remember he said one was at Baylor and one was at TCU. And do you, you remember, I, I, you know, you know, plumbers can afford expensive colleges. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, I can't remember. I can't, I just don't remember, you know, and, and then, and, and your wife says, no, I don't remember either. Okay. Let me tell you though, it will come from your subconscious to your conscious normally right before you go to sleep. When you relax, all of a sudden you say, all star plumbing. You know, you got it. <laughs> right? All right? Okay. So that's what it is. We say it's on the tip of our tongue. No, it's in our subconscious. Your mind categorizes and remembers everything. When you walk in a room, your mind says, have I ever seen, heard, or experienced anything like this before? And your mind immediately says, yes, you've experienced 493 rooms similar to this room. You've seen 71 rooms that were very similar to this room. And you've seen four rooms that were almost identical. That's how we get what we call deja vu. We think, I've been here before. And then if you're, if you're lost and really out there, you think, I've been here in a former life. You hadn't been there in a former life. It's just your mind thinks that. You follow me? This is how you can meet someone and not like them immediately. You be in a restaurant with your wife and you're walking out and she says, oh, honey, wait, wait, this is Susie. You remember Susie? I work out with Susie. I told you about Susie. And of course, you have, you, the answer man is, oh, yes, I remember. You don't have a clue. But you just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember Susie. 
And Susie says, this is my husband, Bill. You say, hi, Bill, how are you? You walk out of the restaurant, you get in the car and you say to your wife, I don't like that guy. <laughs> and she said, well, you just met him. You don't even know him. Oh yeah, I know him. I know his type. <laughs> because your mind said, have I ever met anyone like this? Yes, you've met 364 people who are like this guy. Uh, you've met who are similar. You've met 47 people who are very similar. And you met three who are almost identical, and one of them pulled your shorts down in gym class in seventh grade. <laughs> and your wife said, again, said, you don't know him. Oh, I've got a whole file on him. <laughs> I know exactly what he's like. Are, are y'all following me? Yeah. That, that's how brilliant it is. Okay, so you say, so why are you telling me this? Here's why. Because when you come against, up against a problem that causes you stress or tension, your mind says, have I ever experienced this before? And your mind tells you how to respond. This is called in the Bible a stronghold. This is how stronghold works. If you, if you have a stronghold, you might not want to admit it, but just you don't have to do it out loud, but just to yourself, a stronghold of lust or a stronghold of anger or a stronghold of pride or insecurity or inferiority, or if you have some addiction. This is exactly how addiction works. Exactly. Scientists will agree with this. They just don't make, unless they're Christian, they don't understand the spiritual part. This is what happens. You come in, you see an experience that is similar to something you've had before, and your mind says, I need a drink. I need a drink to handle this, because this, every time I've come to this situation before, I've had to have a drink. Are you following? So that's why we read, listen, remember the title of the message, Stay in the Word. Because what happens is, after a while, your mind says, have I ever experienced anything like this before? And your mind says, yes, I have. And then your mind will say to you, because you're renewing your mind, your mind says, I need to get in the Word. I need to call someone for prayer. See, you totally begin to change the way you deal with these strong. Are y'all, are y'all following me? This is really good. If you don't know good preaching, you know, I'm just helping you. <laughs> this is the way a stronghold works. This, I'm, the three easy steps to victory. Number one, stop believing lies. Here's what else I say on stay in the Word. Start believing the truth. Start believing what God says about you, not what someone else says about you, not what Satan says. So number one, the soul is selfish. Here's number two. The soul must submit to the Spirit. The soul must submit to the Spirit. Now, Romans 9, remember everything in the Old Testament happened in the natural, but it's a spiritual truth to us in the New. And many times... In the New Testament, they'll quote an Old Testament scripture and they'll tell us the spiritual truth. And Romans 9 is telling us one of the spiritual truths in this Old Testament scripture. Here it is. Romans 9 verse 12 says, it was said to her, this is speaking to Rebecca, about Jacob and Esau that were in her womb, the older shall serve the younger. This, I could have given you several examples of this. This is actually a scriptural principle. The older shall serve the younger. Now, for those of you who are the, the older sibling, uh, this is not a natural principle, all right? Don't, and for those of you who are younger, don't say, yep, I knew he should be serving me. Okay, this has nothing to do with natural, okay? Brothers and sisters, siblings. This is a spiritual principle. And what does it mean? Let me tell you, there, there are about four applications of it spiritually, but let me tell you one of them. The soul and the spirit. Okay, when you were conceived in your mother's womb, your soul came alive. And it is at conception it's not at birth. Life does begin at conception. That's very clear in Scripture. You, you, try to, you try to take that baby out of his mother's womb one minute, that's a baby. One minute before he's born, that's still a baby. That's not a giraffe. It's not a blob. It's not goo. It's a baby. It is a baby. It's a human life. It is amazing to me that people will save a beached whale and not a baby. That's amazing. The head of one of the large animal rights movements a while back, she was asked, uh, if there was a baby and a dog drowning, which one would you save? She said, that's a tough one. It's a public statement, you can see it. That's a tough one. No, it's not a tough one, lady. You save the baby. You save human life. 
So anyway, that's just, that was just a side note. That was free. Um, <laughs> but your soul comes alive at conception. Your mind, your will, and your emotions, all right? And then you're born, you go through your life. And then for me, I got saved at 19. Now, now, when you're born, remember, you're born with a dead spirit. Your spirit's dead in trespasses and sins. That's the Bible. Your spirit's dead. But you come to Christ, your spirit is made alive. So I got saved at 19. I was almost 20. So for 20 years, I lived with my soul in charge. I did what I thought was best. I did what I wanted to do, kind of like Elaine at three. She wanted, she wanted to go shopping, so she went, see? And I did what I felt was best for me. But when I was almost 20, my spirit came alive. And my spirit said to my soul, I'm in charge now. And my soul, being the kind and gracious and humble person that he is, said, sure. Or do you think that's what happened? No, my soul said, not without a fight. And my soul's been fighting ever since. But the more I get in this word, receive the engrafted word of God, James says, which is able to save. And that word save is to make whole your souls. There's all these scriptures about converting your souls. It doesn't mean, it's not talking about your eternal salvation. It's talking about converting, changing, changing your soul, letting your soul grow up. So important for us to understand this. My soul uh, my spirit will say, you need to lay down your life for your wife and you need to turn the other cheek. My soul says, uh, you need to give her a piece of your mind and let her know who's boss, uh, which I found out uh, she is. But anyway, I, that's, not, that's not the point. So let me ask you just one little application of this. Are, with what you watch and what you read, are you feeding your soul or your spirit? It is amazing how much we read on the internet and how little we read the Bible. And then you wonder why you don't have strength when you get tempted. Because if, if your soul and spirit were dogs, and they're obviously they're not, I'm trying to use an example. If your soul and spirit were dogs, you've got a great Dane sometimes fighting it out with a chihuahua your soul and your spirit when it should be the other way around because you should have been feeding one and starving the other one. So again, I told you there's a lot of good stuff. This is just practical to you. Okay, David talked to his soul. Remember the word soul means self. So he talked to himself. He wasn't crazy. He talked to himself. He told his soul to not be discouraged. He told his soul to bless God. He told his soul to be quiet. Let me read you one of them. Psalm 131, verse two. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Okay, so I, he says, I've told my soul to calm down and be quiet. But my soul is like a weaned child child, a weaned child. But how do you wean a child? Well, you take him off of milk and you put him on solid food, right? Watch again. The Bible is so perfect. First Corinthians 3 verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes or babies in Christ. I've had to feed you with milk and not solid food. Uh, Hebrews 5, verse 12, for though by now, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. He goes on to talk about those who need milk instead of solid food. They're not, they're not mature. You, you got to grow up. You got you to take your soul off of milk, get your, your soul on solid food. Can I just say something right now? It is important where you go to church. It's important that whoever's preaching to you is preaching the Bible and not good opinions. Good opinions don't help. Good news helps. What the Bible says is what helps you. You want to be fed the Word of God. That's what helps you. Okay? So, uh, now, 
Why does a child, you ever thought about this? He says it's like a weaned child. What does a child do? Let's say that. What does a child do when you try to wean the child? Cries and throws a fit, right? What do you think your soul does? <laughs> Cries and throws a fit. But why? You ever thought about that? Why does a child cry and throw a fit when you're trying to wean the child? I'm going to tell you why. Actually, maybe you never thought of it. Because he thinks you're trying to kill him. You're taking away the only food source he's ever known. Right? He doesn't know there's another food source. So he thinks you're trying to kill him. Okay, listen to me though. <laughs> In the case of the soul, he's right. You are trying to kill him. Let me read it to you. Here's point three, and then I'll read you the scripture. Point three, the soul must die. And I'll show you the scriptures in a minute, but here's what I mean by this. Your selfish thoughts, your selfish desires, and your selfish emotions, feelings need to die. They need to die. You need to die to self. That's the only way you're going to have victory. You have to die to self. What, what you think and what you feel and what you want doesn't matter. To you, my dad used to use the expression, that doesn't matter a hill of beans. Have you ever heard that? Doesn't matter a hill of beans. I remember thinking, a hill of beans. Don't, don't matter. I bet they matter to the guy who planted them. <laughs> but anyway, I, I just don't understand that expression, but I'm sure there's some, something in the back of it. I'll Google it, all right? All right. But here's what I want to show you about how the Bible plays the part in this. I'm going to read you a very famous scripture that everybody knows, but hardly anybody knows the next verse. Hebrews 4, verse 12 for the word of God is living and powerful. You ever seen this verse? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Watch this. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. In other words, the word of God will divide between what you think is right, what you want to do, and what you feel you should do, and he'll, the word of God will tell you what God thinks is right, what God wants you to do, and what God feels you should do. But the word of God's the only thing that does it. The word of God, and remember it's like a sword. I just want you to remember the word sword, all right? And of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, and would you, if you, would you like to see the soul, the mind, will, and emotions? Watch. Of the thoughts, that's the mind. The intents, that's the will. Of the heart, that's the emotions. The heart is the seat of the emotions, we're told. You know, I love you with all my heart. I feel this way in my heart. How do you feel in your heart about this? That's where your feelings are. That's where your emotions originate. Mind, will, and emotions right through the Bible. Now, verse 13, most people have, no, have never even read it, or if they've read it, they read right over it. But it's the key. Verse 13, and, so the thought is continuing, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open, remember the word open, to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, I, I, I know that that didn't, I don't think that probably meant anything to you as to how that fits into verse 12. The word of God is like a sword that would divide between the soul and spirit. I'm gonna tell you how it fits in. Okay, this word open, it's a great word. In, the, in English, again, we have a very limited language compared to Greek and Hebrew. And we don't have words to translate what they really should, the way they really should be translated many times. So the word open is a Greek word, and I don't want you guys, I've got the definition, but don't put the definition up yet. Let me just say the word first. Trachy leadso. Now, many Greek words, you can figure out a little bit of what they're talking about because they sound like English words. Greek was translated to Latin and then Latin into English. For instance, the Greek word uh, cardia would be the heart right? The Greek word logos, we, we call it, is the English word logic, logic. Uh, the Greek word graphe means graph, um, suke, the Greek word is soul. I mean, there are so many, okay? Like even psychology, the study of the soul, okay? So, trachy 
lead so. So the first part is trachea. Anyone know what trachea is? It's your throat. It's your windpipe, right? So that's your throat, but it's your windpipe specifically. Trachea. Lead so is a little different. It's a military term. Remember, many, many Greek words are military or uh, athletic terms. Military, athletic. So it's a military term. Okay, you ready for this? I'm going to show you the exact Strong's exhaustive concordance definition of the tracheolitso, the word tracheolitso. You ready? Tracheolitso is to bend back the neck of a victim to be slain, to expose the gullet of a victim for killing. Can I tell you something? God has big plans for your soul. (laughs) That's what he would love to do with your unredeemed thoughts, your unredeemed desires, and your unredeemed feelings. He'd love to kill them and replace them with what he thinks about you, what he wants for your life, and how he feels about you. He would love to do that. He doesn't want to kill you. He wants to kill what's killing you. He doesn't want to kill you. He wants to kill what's killing you. Your soulish, selfish thoughts your soulish, selfish desires, and your soulish, selfish feelings. He wants to kill them. And he would, think about this. He would love for you to think about yourself the way he thinks about you. He would love for you to know what he wants and desires for your life. And he would love for you to know how he feels about you rather than what the devil tells you that he feels about you. He would love for you to know that. So he wants to, he wants, so you came to church, here's some good news. God's trying to kill you. (laughs) He's trying to kill your old self. Hey, it's all through scripture. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified. I, I heard a pastor say one time, Christ went to the cross so you wouldn't have to. Well, that's not bad. It's not bad when you're talking about eternal salvation. But there's a scripture we need to reconcile with that. Here's Jesus talking. Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus says to the disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Guess what? You have a cross too. (laughs) You have a cross too. And then Jesus goes further with this truth in Luke, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Why'd you have to say the word Daily. Can I just do it once? Can I just walk down the aisle once and accept Jesus? Yes, and go to heaven. But if you want to live an overcoming life, you're going to have to crucify the flesh every day. You're going to have to come to the cross every day. And then Paul, Paul says it, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, I die daily. Does that mean he died every day? He got saved every day? It means he got saved every day. It means he crucified himself every day. Okay, so it's the word. Stay in the word. Okay, but so one morning I was reading the word, normal practice for me, and I was a little uh, short on time, but I wanted, I tried to read at least one chapter a day. I like to read where you read through the Bible in a year. So it's so many chapters in the new, so many in the old. And then sometimes you do Psalms and Proverbs more. But I'm, I, was, I was thought, well, gonna, I, I have a thing that I'm gonna read at least one chapter a day. So, but I, had, but I was in a hurry, so I kind of read it quickly, okay? So I read the chapter, closed it, my laptop, started to leave, and the Lord said to me, hey, uh, what did you just read? And I had this thing come to me when our children were younger, sometimes they'd say, I wanna go to big church. And I want to hear daddy preach. But Debbie wisely would say afterward, um, what did daddy preach on today? And they would say, uh, God. 
and uh, and Jesus, God and Jesus. So I'm sitting there, and the Lord said to me, "What'd you just read?" And then He reminded me of that, and He said, "You will say God and Jesus, because you don't have a clue what you just read, do you?" I said, "No." And the Lord said to me, "Son." Now, listen to the whole statement, okay? He said, I'm not asking you to just read the Word every day. I'm asking you to let the Word read you. I actually want to speak to you. Now, you know, at at the end of every message, I say something, and now pastors are actually using this all over the world. It's kind of cool, and maybe other pastors used to say it, but I'd never heard it. But at the end of every message, I say to you, after I say, by your hands, close your eyes, I say, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message, right? Okay, when you read the Bible, I'm giving you another question. You should say, what's the Holy Spirit saying to me through this passage? And if you want to walk in victory, you're going to have to stop believing lies, and you're going to have to stay in the world. You're going to have to. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And now you can ask yourself that question. What's the Holy Spirit saying to me through this message? It's amazing to me how many people have bondages they can't get free from, but the key is getting in God's Word every day. It's staying in the Word of God. And you're never going to have your spirit overcome your soul. God's thoughts overcome your thoughts. God's desires overcome your desires. And God's emotions, feelings overcome your feelings. Unless you get in the Word. And then it's going to start becoming natural for you. So we want to pray with you. If you're going through a difficulty right now at every campus, we want to pray with you. Any, any difficulty you're going through, we want to pray. And I, I, want, to, I want to, before we pray, um, I want you to just, I just noticing, uh, just look at me for a minute. I was noticing one of our apostolic elders, James, here, and I think God put something on his heart. So I just want to just let you say what you feel the Lord's put in your heart first. Let me, let me say something very clearly to you, as important as anything you'll hear. God wants to kill in us what's killing his life innocent through us so his life can flow through us fully and freely unconditional redemptive transforming power and love if you would say to him today I want to offer to you my soul that my soul may be dead to self so your life can be revealed in me as clearly as in your son Jesus who now lives in me and desires to live fully and freely flowing through me continually That's what every born-again heart longs for. It's in harmony with God's heart. And if we would say that to him today, no matter how attracted our soul is to something the self desires, I want to offer that which I desire and even foolishly love to you as the sacrifice of a broken, contrite, yielded heart that you will come alive in me because my soul has died that you might live. Thank you, James. I just felt so stirred during that that when we open the altars today at every campus, I think some of you need to come and offer that which you haven't been over to, able to overcome on your own. Offer it to God. 
and let him deal with it because he can deal with it.